So welcome to the second session of discussion on how we can improve the performance and maintainability of Merge Request Diffs app. And we'll get started right away from the points that we left from last week. Um, can someone please confirm that you're seeing the agenda? Is it shared? Okay, cool. Um, so these were the points that we uncovered last week. This is the agenda. At the bottom, we still have the takeaways. So I'll be adding as we go, go on um, through the call today. But you had already filled the agenda with some points that we didn't get to cover because of time. So I would probably start us there. Paul, uh, do you want vocal your, to your, vocalize your first point? Sure. Yeah. So talking about uh, improving performance, um, I don't know how does it affect maintainability, but um, since every bit of state we give to Vue, Vue makes reactive. Sometimes it takes a huge initial cost, but then it also takes a long lasting memory cost of all the watcher functions it needs to create. So what parts of our state tree do not need to be reactive? And we can, I know that you can object that freeze something and Vue won't touch it. Um, the reason this though is kind of a hit on maintainability is how does the developer know is this reactive or is this not reactive? Um, and that's an somewhat of an unanswered question, I think, in the GitLab code base of how do we handle these. Um, but I don't know if anyone else has any experience or thoughts on isolating parts of the state that doesn't need to change into certain buckets. Um, even some of those of like huge files, um, like our individual lines. Uh, probably don't need to be reactive because they don't really uh and once we get the whole file i don't think those lines change at all during the life of an mr um i don't know what are your all thoughts i know that uh phil had mentioned this in the past um about the object freeze um phil do you want to talk a little bit about that i want to come start but yeah i think probably 99% of the state that we have doesn't change. We really have like the whole diffs come in really what changes is whether there's a comment on the line or not. So I think we could probably differentiate them two quite easily. Yeah, I think we even tried some of this, Justin, I think you played around with this at a certain point. I, I did a little bit. Um, I didn't get any performance benefit using object freeze, but it, I didn't get to spend a lot of time on it either. Um, it wasn't it wasn't the reactivity that seemed to be the problem so much as it was just the giant dump of information coming in up front and the setup and tear down of all of those components. And, yeah, and that, remember, that would make sense. Go Sorry, ahead, I, didn't interrupt. I brought this up because um, this is an issue that the web IDE has um, where there is this huge setup time and it's with Vuex. And so there's there's an opportunity there in the web IDE for um, keeping a control of what needs to be reactive and what doesn't. But I, I can understand based on a previous conversation, this might not be as relevant. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't discard it completely though, because um, well the, the the theory definitely makes sense. And one of the things that we identified when when Justin was playing around with it is that it's very hard to now, once we have everything set on the state, start to take that apart and see what can be frozen, what can't be, be frozen. So I feel like that's more of a principle that we should carry on forward in that when we're restructuring the state into whatever shape that is, um, we need to keep, keep our minds, if we could put buckets or of like stuff that is never gonna change, or if we just use prefixing, that's also a good approach, so that we can know exactly what will be, um, frozen or not, um, and static will never update. So that's more of an aspect for us to keep in mind when, when we're reworking the state um, into, into whatever that is. But I feel like this has been a topic, bringing the cost down of, of building things up and tearing it down is definitely gonna be there for the, for the ongoing work. So thanks for raising it. Uh, any more thoughts on the frozen, frozen, frozen thing, freezing? Let it go. Can I let it go? All right. I'm going to let it go. Uh, I'm going to write it down below, but Thomas, can you please voice your um, topic, please? Yeah. Um, last I knew, I hope everybody can hear me. Last I knew, um, 
it was a couple months ago, maybe, um, uh, maybe about two months ago, there were some unrelated um, discussions in like, is this known um, about someone had left their MR page open um, and they did a, it wasn't someone on our team, but they had done a, they'd done like a, a perf test just on their browser because it, it had slowed down. And it showed just a just a steady, almost linear increase in memory use um, over time. And it was just it was in the background, just running, sitting in a tab. Um, so we have a memory leak somewhere, and I don't know where it is or what it is. Um, but I think that my suspicion is that it should not be increasing in memory over time. Um, it probably has to do with refetching notes every couple of seconds or, or I, don't, I don't know what runs on a, on a polling thing, but something is something is leaking memory just linearly over time. Um, and we could probably improve a lot of just browser performance by just fixing that. Um, I don't know. That it's going to, it's a, I don't know that it's a big long-term fix for like the maintain maintainability of the code itself, but it's, it's, it's something that we could do to probably improve just performance in general. I, I think I brought this up. Are you referring to to that thread that I created of like, hey, we're taking a lot of on. Do you remember it being me? Because uh, I, I, I don't remember it being it. you, but I oh, don't okay. remember who it was at all. So um, it, could, it totally could have been you. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, that was that was one MR. Yeah, there was one MR that we put on our watch list that you raised uh, because it was reaching incredible amounts of memory used. And we couldn't reproduce it on render of the page, but as we interacted with it, it definitely climbed up the, the scale. What I, what I had noticed was also was like, you could get it to blow up by switching tabs. If you switch from discussions to changes, right. if you keep doing that, then something happens. Um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna I haven't I wanna been definitely... able to recreate it. We, sure. we it was a while ago i have i don't know if it's been inadvertently fixed or or i don't know i think so. that was incredibly felt before we enabled uh, batch diffs and the split of inline and parallel so that was probably beneficial but i still think we have a problem uh, that thomas identified because it's still it's still present there to a point um okay. so yeah natalie do you want to voice your answer your question where well, actually, I was yeah. just asking if have you tried to research this already on our side? Yeah, and my and my response is I don't know of any um, research that's been done directly into this, other than in in the effort of doing other things, like the split diffs, for example. Like, was did did the split diffs actually improve performance and memory usage? Um, so this is probably worth revisiting what Paul has talked about and maybe yeah. some other stuff to actually get some stats on whether we're leaking memory or not. Yeah. So to your answer to your question, Talia, um, I, I think there was some time in the past there that we looked specifically at memory leaks, but it was too long ago. It was after the merge request re refactor. We did take a look at certain parts of the code base that were leaking, but since then I would say like, 20, late 2018, we haven't done like a deep audit of it. And I feel like part of this next effort that we're going to be doing, we're going to have to um, find like the quick, quick wins. And I, I would kind of now, um, compare this to those improvements that the backend has been working on specific endpoints that are identified to be taking longer. So we probably need to identify and do a little bit of an audit and to see what are the worst offenders here. Um, and we haven't done a focused work on that. No, we haven't. Then we probably should. Um, do you have any tips, experience with that, and like um, identifying memory leaks in heavy, big view apps? Anybody? That is a hard no from me. I do not have experience in that. <laughs> okay. No problem. We'll definitely have to wing this and 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 see the best we can. Um, so so I already took a note of that audit that we will be doing for the memory leak. Um, any other thoughts regarding the memory leak? Because most of um, the the things that we've been seeing have been through interaction, whether booting up the diff app and then switching over between tabs, but also living comments, living merge request reviews, uh, that sort of thing is definitely felt uh, like it's increasing the weight of the merge request until it just becomes too heavy and then we just re refresh the page 
and everything starts to come back to normal. So we'll definitely have to do a widespread sweep to see if we can find the worst offenders. Um, so maybe we can move on to the next point. Uh, Phil, um, one of my favorite points on the agenda today. So like we're all talking about kind of different changes here and around the place. I would just if it would be easy just to rewrite it all just from start. Um, it's kind of a big undertaking. And then I'm slightly worried that probably our feature specs don't cover most of the um, features that we have on the diffs. But I'm just throwing it out there because we're spending a lot of time talking about little changes. Anyone got any thoughts? Yeah, my computer is lagging, so I couldn't unmute myself. Um, so yeah, at the first time that this has been mentioned, we kind of like laughed and we, we kind of discarded it a little bit, but then we paused and we thought it hard and it's probably something that we can think about to take some iterative approach to this for sure. Um, so one of the things that I remember is that when we were building the batch comments, the merge request route reviews was that we used a, um, a module for the state for the batch comments. So I wonder, could we... Could we start rewriting things into modules uh, in Vuex state? In in like, because Paul is asking, could we rewrite a slice? And maybe we could rewrite a part of it. Um, but my question is, would that still be beneficial if we do it partially? Because I've seen good benef uh, some benefits on the editor team, where um, I believe Dennis was working on writing a slimmed down version of the web IDE, and he started off from scratch. Uh, and I've seen good benefits of that. It's going to be like a long road of moving things from one place to the other, but there would be a significant uh, split, a, a separation between the old uh, app and the new app. Um, so yeah, any benefits of doing it partially or should we follow or just consider some approach like the one that Dennis did? To, to dive into how, how Dennis has done this, and a part of it was that there were some key components in that we now had a reusable reusable use case for. Um, so with the web IDE, it's a multi-file editor, our eventual goal is to have multi-file snippets. And so we were talking about, hey, can we repurpose the web IDE for this? Um, without really having to give a real answer now, the answer is no, <laughs> um, because there's a lot of coupling there. Um, and that's something we want to fix really hard to do iteratively and we kind of wish we had thought of hardening down a simplified api for what does this simple editor look like it's really easy to do from scratch and so i like this rewrite it all approach um, because it allows us to start from a blank page what is that simple api of my components that i want um, but it, it does kind of seem to go orthogonal to the GitLab spirit of being iterative, but I think if you can find, here's, here's a place where some of these diff components can be reused. Now you can, okay, I can now, rather than reusing diff components, let me build these from scratch with the purpose of replacing these old diff components. And now I've done, I've technically rewrote it all, but under, the scope of reusability, which by definition is going to be decoupled and um, easier to maintain. So the uh, the approach and I didn't dive into it. So thanks for thanks for um, typing it out, Thomas. But was is there something about MR diffs or whatever about the yeah? Is there something about merge request diffs that can be reused outside of merge request diffs. Let's build that from scratch with the intent of replacing merge request diffs. Um, Cause that I think gives you both iterate iteration and this, the benefits you get from not carrying on lots of technical debt and stuff. So having just come through the rewrite of the version dropdowns that Paul and I worked on quite a bit. Um, I don't, I'm not as strong into the rewrite everything from scratch as we were before. Um, seeing how it was possible to untangle one piece in place. Um, I think that's probably the better approach here. Um, 
Yeah, and there, especially since there's a lot of ways that we structure the merge request that really lends itself to doing it piecemeal. Like the inline versus parallel split by itself is an easy demarcation to say, I'm going to attack inline first and we can completely leave the parallel code untouched and just work on inline in place until that's okay. Um, and also kind of a bottom up sort of approach like we saw Simon do when he did the tiny refactor of the, the gutters component and just getting rid of that completely. And that was a pretty decent performance win because so many of these things are reused so much. If we start low and work our way up, uh, we might see enough performance benefit that we don't have to completely overhaul the whole thing. Um, and I still think there's a lot of benefit to be had from it by just fixing the state, which I think is a point a little farther down. And I think if we handle all those things, we don't really need to, I think we'll end up eventually re rewriting the whole thing, but in place as opposed to just throwing it away and starting over. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Um, I, I think that that's a good thing to bear in mind when we're considering rewriting all of this. Um, there is some questions. So when we're talking about rewriting all of this and we do it progressively, I see a scenario where you have a separate, separate view app that has its own state, has its own inner workings and somehow communicates with the other app. Um, the thing is, this means that we'll be adding another view app to the page uh, to solve a performance problem that for the interim solution will be just adding more overhead as a theory. So I don't know, there's some questions to be answered there, whether that's a valid approach, um, but something that we have to bear in mind as a possibility to start, a, start an app on the side and then kind of pick a certain part of the component a certain component of the current app to rewrite it to that app and have it some way interactive. I'm going to, I'm going to document it because I want to, I want to discuss this a little bit further. Um, so I'll, I'll put it there in the takeaway so that we can create an issue on it and we can discuss what would be a good candidate for this. The one thing that I would think of is for example, using your example, Justin, about the compare versions. I don't think the performance problems are coming from that or the memory footprint it's coming from that because it's rarely used when it's used it's using a lot of complex code for sure and the front end is doing a lot of heavy lifting but i don't feel like that's a bottleneck so we should probably try to have a discussion towards what would be one of the heavy components that we can extract to outside of the app and have it communicated within so i think the i think the commit view is almost has, has maybe like 80 percent of the features of mr diffs uh because you can leave comments on commits commit shows the differences between and that commit view i think right now is in haml uh, so i think i think that, that that is a pretty prime candidate for let's let's approach diffs from bottom up from this commit approach knowing that hey we can also this is the same problem that mr is also trying to solve um, that would be interesting so what you're saying is like we could consider rewriting instead of just refactoring the commit view in Haml to use the components in the, in the diffs, we would build a new app for the commits and, and try to then build it, thinking about the merge request diffs in mind and then move it there. That would have the benefit of not having that work affect the merge request page until it's ready. Um, all right, I'll write it down. Any other thoughts here? Sorry to keep you all right. Uh, Phil, do you want to move on to your next point while I write this? Yep. yep. And we're doing all these changes. I just wonder if we can somehow uh, test the performance of it because we have a baseline that we've got now. So at least we know we've improved it and not made it much worse. Now, so, I don't know. I remember hearing somewhere that QA actually had some performance testing. I don't know if we can use that somehow. So testing it manually is pretty straightforward, but I have, I don't know how to automate that. You know, like taking performance snapshots before and after changes is fine, but that's pretty tedious. And I don't think that's what we're talking about. So does anybody have any experience of automating performance testing? 
or should we rope a QA person into this offline? <laughs> I can share what we, what we have done and what we're looking for and what we've learned. Um, so one of the things that Rami has set up, which is what you're, you're talking about, Phil, is an automated job that will grab the reviews app and run some performance comparisons to it. So that's currently uh, in the pipeline. So if you look at the review performance job, that's what it's doing. And it's trying to run a script uh, on a merge request page and, to and get the timings of it all. At the time, we felt like it, it can grab like the global, like DOM ready, page load, but not much else. So it's hard to like, for example, grasp the impact of memory, for example, as you interact on the page. Um, so it kind of fell short of what we wanted. We never evolved it too much. We can look again to it, but one of the things that we saw was um, the performance of reviews app, since it's virtualized and it's never like fully guaranteed to have the same resources, it's kind of flaky anyways. So if you wanna, if you wanna run a test and master and then compare it with our branch, it's not necessarily noticeable if the variation is based off the virtualization of it all or the actual code. So I don't think it was as reliable as we expected. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other, yes, we've done some tests manually. And the other thing I would add, just to conclude my participation in this topic, is that we have a section in the handbook to track historic performance metrics. Um, and I've just, I've just did, done an, um, um, an update the other day. Uh, and this is what it does. It basically uses site speed uh, to, to go and check the speed index of the page. And so for example, the page you'll be looking at would be this, um, like a merge request that is complex. And as you see, it's coming down um, um, a lot. So in 2018, it was 27,000, and then it went down significantly. So uh, this would be the number we'll be looking for, but it is abstracted into the speed index of um, site speed, which I'll have to Google, I have to tie in with Google. This is kind of like one way of tracking the overall performance of the page. It's not as detailed as we need though. It doesn't, once we go into the reports, it does give you a bunch of details uh, of the page itself. Uh, so this would be it. So we can, we can get a bunch of information here. So that's something to keep in mind is that we can use this to kind of write a tool that would kind of give us reports on a daily basis or something. Uh, or alarms on based on this, but I haven't uh, worked on that. So, any thought? Any other thoughts? Participation. Um, can we add? Sorry, sorry give me a uh, Can we add um, manual timers or something uh, to trigger century entries in some way? Mm -hmm. You can put it up on a dashboard easier. I don't know about um, century specifically, but most of those. Most of those uh, like error catching tools on the front end allow you to send back events at any point. So um, we probably can. I know we have we have so many things in in the front end that we could use. I, I don't know when what the case is for Sentry versus Snowplow, for example, because we already have Snowplow like events that we can send back. I don't know where we would want to do that. I guess maybe Sentry is the place since it's a front end specific framework or whatever. Yeah. We I, have, I, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jesse, go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering if we have like a goal of how much time we can actually save with this change or I wonder if we're, if we're doing that iterative approach, if we change one part of it, could we notice um, a difference already, and I wonder if that kind of give us confidence that we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Um, we, we should probably have some sort of um, known large bad MR that we can recreate consistently mm -hmm. as, as our primary metric, like, like Andre showed in the handbook page that he had. And, and running against that. That's an excellent point. Yeah, so we, we've done that in the past for specific features uh, of improving performance. Uh, the test we would run would be, and I've done this with a couple of you for the batch diffs, where we would get the timings. I don't know where I kept that spreadsheet. 
but I'll I'll search while I while I um, speak if I can. Uh, it, what we do then is is very manually and very time intensive. Is that we'll run a profile on the page of the merge request in master and then switch back to the feature branch warm up the caches and then run the profile again and then we'll compare basically the timings of scripting rendering and most mostly that the idols the idle periods we ignore um, and that will give us an, a good confidence of whether we have an impact the, the problem samantha is that that is now currently done manually and it's very hard to automate that minutia uh, into uh, our tooling. But I, I'd be keen to, to identifying potential tools to, to improve this. And then we can raise those with the quality team to see if we can improve the, the solution we have right now. Because um, you mentioned, Justin, about adding markers. And that was, that was briefly mentioned. We could add markers and we can have the, the script track. The, when those when those markers are emitted, uh, and to Paul's excellent point about the observation of an experiment changes its outcome, um, so all that they're doing is they're leveraging the timings API, um, the timing API, uh, which is native to the browser, so we can add custom events if, I, if I'm not mistaken, and that was the idea: is to leverage something that won't be affecting the performance of 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 the test of the page just by testing it. Is we don't measure anything; we just report. To the timing API, uh, and then we'll read it later. Um, but that's a great, excellent point. More thoughts on this? I'm going to take a note of this. This is good stuff. Yeah. Along Paul's observation comment as well, when I was doing my performance testing stuff, I had a huge issue with using um, Vue's built in performance flag, you can say. Um, it, on the MRS page, it wildly slowed it down and made it pretty inconsistent to test. I had much better um, luck just using console time logs. So it's uh, worth noting that trying to use views built in performance stuff, which it says in, in the docs, you know, don't use this in production, but it'd be nice to have something that we could leave running somehow in actual production code so we can see how it's truly affecting it. Because I, I saw huge swings between using that or trying things in dev versus actually having it out in a branch somewhere. It was a, it was a beast to performance test this thing. Could we leave things like that around in, in staging? Like could we re leave non-production flags around in, in our staging environment and maybe have you know, bots hit MRs and start pinging some stuff? Well, I, I could go even a step further and um, I've, I've worked on, on a couple of projects where we would leave the, not a console log, we would have our own logger kind of thing that would be an abstraction layer and we can turn it off and on manually. What that meant was that we would have our logger go with the code into production, which will increase probably the size of the bundles, but it would be silenced in production and we would potentially go in production and enable it. So we would be able to debug these things in production. I don't That's know if this really is an approach. Idea. I've seen that too. I've seen this. I've seen some code bases like kind of look for an environment variable, uh, like a global environment variable. Right. Is it available or not? And if so, then I'm gonna start using it. And that would be really neat. It would give us so much visibility on some of the weird quirks in production. Um, that would be really cool uh, for us to start enabling uh, some some developer deep diving on in production pages that would be yeah. nice. Um, I think it's important to distinguish between the current, the typical console log usage we use in development, which you definitely don't want to have in production, but some more definite like performance logger or something like that, that would be only used for markers like this. Um, then we could potentially keep that into the code and would, it wouldn't be a console log. It would be something that leverages console log if, he, if it's enabled, something like that. But all right, it's a small minor point, so we'll just take a note of that and we'll discuss it later. Um, any more points regarding this performance test in, uh, before we move on? I have a few, I have a few things yeah. is that um, there's a lot of, it's clear like we're still in this elaboration discovery phase of what does performance testing look like. Um, and it, just to emphasize like this has organization wide benefits. So there's, in my opinion, like there's a high profitability of what we invest into this because this isn't just, there's 
across all of front end, we could use help on performance testing. Um, so I think I think any effort we put into figuring that out is um, would be really cool. Right. Um, Thanks. I would suggest like not doing a full rewrite of everything until we've done this because you know the the view MR diffs was a full rewrite, and so we don't want to end up one we don't want to end up with the same problems even if we're making iterative approaches or even if we're making one big big leap. I think this is this is sounds to me like a pretty significant yeah a requirement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing that, one idea that came to mind though is, um, cause we're talking about wanting to test not just like page load and some rudimentary metrics, but maybe even like test certain behaviors and things and the performance related there. Um, so something that's we're severely missing in front end is front end integration tests. We have front end unit tests, we have feature specs, but we don't have just front end integration tests. And these would raise warnings. If our front end integration tests are, are slow, it would raise warnings that something is slow here and so we're not doing this as fast as we could. Um, just like we kind of fail jest specs if they're too slow. Right now though, that, that number is a little ridiculously high because we're still cleaning those up. Um, but over an editor, we're, we're kind of going to be trailblazing what do front end integration tests look like for, for the web IDE. So we can, because a lot of it is a front end app. So let's just spin it up. Somehow we stub the back end and then we run through some use cases and make sure that uh, the user can do this. Um, that figuring out how do we then maybe make sure that those tests are, aren't too slow could also give us some of this benefit. And especially at the more, detailed use case level, not just was page load good. Um, right. That's good. Thanks. And keep us posted on that front. I'll, yeah, I'll definitely stick yeah. up with Roman regarding that effort to, so that we're both on, 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 on track, uh, in sync with that thing. Um, yeah. I feel like that trailblazing, it will be beneficial for us to learn from and, uh, and keep us posted. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited about it. It should be next milestone is, is the goal. Um, the other thought, and we were already talking about this, uh, I put down there was, I know Tim Zolman has this huge goal for all empowering all teams to, you know, be looking at their dashboards and metrics and, and being married to this. The, the issue, and it kind of with that, with that table, the issue is these reveal issues after they're merged into master, not necessarily before. Um, it's still helpful having that, that eye so that we catch it maybe before users do. Um, or before end users or even the um, self hosted end users. But is there, is there a, for, do we have Sentry dashboards yet for, for front end? I know that's something that we're, we're working overall, but is there any work for the MRs with front end and, and Sentry dashboards? Not planned, but uh, it's something that we're kind of, um waiting for guidance on the sentry part whoever's dealing with that thing i remember dennis i think was addressing that um so we haven't heard any guidance yet but we'll definitely hook it up once it's there i think we've done some activities on um like adding it to snowplow just for metrics of usage not particular focused on performance but we'll definitely keep an eye on that for sure um cool uh, thanks, Paul. Anyone has any other points before we move on from this particular thing of tracking performance? And thanks, Phil, for raising is definitely a great point we need to bear in mind. Nope. Okay. Um, and Phil, you have your next point as well. It's just something to keep note of. That half of this effort is going to just be tackling issue discussions as well. They kind of like tightly coupled together. Just something to note. Yeah, and just so that it's clear, um, we have an app for the discussions tab, we have an app for the diffs, the changes tab, and they are sharing the state, correct? Yep. And everything that touches notes will definitely be impacting the discussions as well. Uh, and there's also um, a lot of the code that is shared between the issue itself. So even we might not be breaking the discussions tab, but we might be breaking the discussion tabs on the issues. So something, is that, is that what you're warning? Yeah. Good, good, good. Definitely good to know. Uh, we were just having 
discussion about a particular line of code that has like three ways of grabbing the content of the note. And one is for batch comments, the other is for merge request comments, and the other is for issue discussions, and they're all in the merge request actions. So it definitely is going, definitely going to be something we have to deal with while we're untangling these things. Uh, anybody has questions about the, this point? Cool. Uh, Justin. Uh, this is more of a, this might be a little too um, nitpicky and specific, but it just, it was one of the things I ran into while I was doing the most the refactor with the drop downs recently. Um, and oh, hold on, I'm full of the document. Where was I? Uh, it's, I think this is probably just lumped that under the state review discussion and about how uh, the, the front end is just doing a lot of state management that seems unnecessary. And I think um, even in, in this case could probably be ex abstracted into kind of the um, uh, view X sort of uh, the view, the view model thing that Paul and I have talked about last time where we can actually use this as kind of a, a manipulation layer before the front end actually starts using it so that we actually have it in the shape that we want like this, start version thing that I ran into is just a very unwieldy, but I think it's probably too specific for this particular call. Um, I kind of want to just put that underneath as an example of a particular state management problem that I ran into and move on. Thanks, Justin. Um, but this, this kind of thing gets exploded in discussions because it is the model of what a discussion looks like and like is a discussion resolved like this is yeah this is a really isolated example of just comparing versions but this problem gets i think really blown to scale when the component level is having to do lots of calculations or are we resolved or not and like with discussions in particular is, um i think that's riddled with this the same situation so hundred percent. And I think a lot of these things kind of can be resolved using Thomas's idea of flattening how we store the data in the store. Um, I see huge benefit of that. And it's kind of like the, the first thing I personally want to attack is just fixing the way we store state. I think we can actually achieve a lot of performance benefits and maintainability benefits um, by reducing a lot of the duplication that's happening in memory. As I know, the discussions in particular get added into the arrays of the diffs and back over the discussions tabs as well. We're, we have that same chunk of memory duplicated in multiple places. Right, and we do like this syncing thing of like, if, if we change something, we then like resync it all to, to that. Oh, yeah. And yeah, those are, that on top of, you know, the amount of garbage that we're probably creating in memory and things that have to get cleaned up too. Like it's, uh, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And thanks for bringing up this specific yeah. example. Too. Yes. So this brings me, this brings a question in my mind, which um, we should definitely have a, a decision or a design principle in a way that there, there are two ways of looking at the state management, right? We can we can keep our repetition and duplication on the state management to on a state to a minimum, and then handle all kind of other shapes of data that we need through getters. That will decrease the number of bytes that we use for the state, but we'll probably have more computation whenever we need to do something and to work, which it, I guess will have you duplicate the data for us. So it's kind of a bit out of our control uh, if we have it through getters. Now, bringing the topic of getters is how do you all feel about should we minimize the use of getters? Should we try to make the state as straightforward as we, sh as we can? Uh, or should we, um, and that means probably duplicating the state, the data inside the state ourselves so that view doesn't have to do it through getters. So any thoughts there? Uh, without having a backend engineer in this call to defend themselves, I think we should get the data in the form that we need it from the backend. Um, and I'm, I'm only kind of half joking. I think the, the answer is right there in, in the name itself. Like the front end should be doing state management in regards to how things are displayed. Um, but right now it's doing a lot of just 
data manipulation to get it usable at all. And I think that's a, that's a problem. Um, I can't see Natalia's face. I'm, I'm, oh yeah, she's still here. Okay. Um, with knowing what you know about like the way the discussions are stored and we have like a big list of discussions and merge requests on the discussions page, but then in diffs, we have a smaller set of discussions. What would this look like in, a, in Apollo where I have one query that's returning all discussions for an MR, but then I'm going to just update like a single discussion or, or add a new one on this line of diff. Is there an issue with like on these two pages, one, I have a filter of discussions and then the other one, I'm like collecting all of them and I just update a single one. How, how does, how does the state get synchronized and across multiple Apollo queries? And, does that question even make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, for Apollo, it's actually, we have single source of truth as Apollo cache. And when we change anything, like when we send a mutation, if it's just an update, it updates automatically for us using an ID or any kind of unique identifier we can define. If we're changing something, we need, if we're adding an entity or deleting an entity, we call an update hook on mutation and we're changing this ourselves on the client side. So this part looks exactly like Vuex and Vuex you call your dispatch an action that commits mutation. On Apollo client, you call an update hook and you're kind of changing Apollo cache yourself. So it's like not a big benefit here, but about getters, I think we discussed it previous time and I would vote rather for transforming data when we fetch data rather than transforming data when we're trying to get something from the state to the component. So there's not a one-to-one -one of record in our cache to query. I can have multiple queries point to the same I guess record in our cache, and that's I'm so ignorant on all of this. I appreciate you letting me ask now your questions, Natalia. Yes, you can do this, and this is completely fine. Apollo, we're actually doing this on design management. Yeah. Um, so, given that the distinction is not a lot, a lot, and we're definitely considering not going towards GraphQL at this stage. Um, I think we're keeping with Vuex unless we build a new app. And then we're going to have to kind of have a conversation about the backend. But as before, like you, Natalia, you, you just mentioned, you already discussed this a little bit on, on last week. We're definitely not going to pursue, or not definitely, we're potentially not going to pursue Apollo and GraphQL at this stage, um, just be give, given the entire complexity of the application that we have in our hands. Um, but still, it's important. This topic that I just captured here, about transforming the data on fetch and not later. That sounds good to me. Um, and this together with the freezing of certain parts of the state could potentially give us a good benefit of if we know that that data is static and will not change, we can duplicate it, have a smaller impact in memory, but less overhead. Sorry, we'll have impact on memory, so we'll have more duplicated memory on the state but we won't have to rework it a lot and we won't have as many watchers because it's not reactive. Um, so yeah, good. Uh, any more thoughts? Yeah, while we're daydreaming here, um, speaking to the transforming at the fetch, which I also totally agree with is the better way to go. Uh, is there any, do we have any feeling about, um, so I, I know we mentioned last time about an issue of just changing things on the back end. Now that is kind of a problem because they have more clients than just ourselves. Like there are people consuming that API that isn't just gitlab.com or our own personal client. Um, is there any thoughts around, um, I know infrastructure doesn't like the idea of us just building node servers flippantly, but if we could offload this to a, in Justin's beautiful world, we can do whatever he wants, a, a node server or endpoint that we can write ourselves to do that transformation, not in the browser, and then consume that endpoint for this particular client. Kind of like a little uh, front end only reverse proxy kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. I've done Sounds a lot like uh, service workers, doesn't it? Could we do this in a service worker? I mean, it would still be in the browser, but. 
some um, some things to just I think keep in mind is that we're what we are identifying by not solving it all the way up the stream is that data needs to be transferred. We can't solve it here at the client level. Or yeah, we could we could totally have proxies that do things and have data, quote unquote, data warehouses, whatever. Um, but the downside is that that compute we pay for, the client's compute we don't pay for. And ideally with, with a lot of you know front end applications like it's nice when the client gets to handle all this. Hopefully it's a good user experience, but we don't have to, we don't have to pay for that CPU tick. So I think there's, we, the problem isn't just isolated a front end. We, we could solve the front end performance by offloading it to another problem area. Um, so I would, I would suggest, and I think it goes back to there's the adage of of you know good algorithms beat fast computers any day. Like if you do an L, if you do an exponential algorithm versus a logarithmic algorithm, I could run it on a stinky Raspberry Pi and it's gonna beat my MacBook. Like that's that's the real win in my in my humble opinion. And I think this is a good brainstorm, but I would I think that there's a there's a a full stacker problem. <laughs> um, when I make a note on what Paul just said about um, that we that we pay for things in the back end. It's true. We do pay in dollars for things in the back end. But um, the MR diffs is or the MR stuff is something that we want to have be lovable, uh, remain lovable, I guess, as a product. And if, if we're paying if we're paying on the if we're not paying by putting something on the front end, we are actually paying a little bit. It's in users perceived performance. So we might actually be paying a little bit out of our little coin purse of vulnerability um, and reducing that would be good. Yeah, and that's a really good point that there's not a yeah. there's not a yes, no, there's a there's a profitability answer here. And that's a really good. Yeah, point. but I think that there's some there's some uh, interesting things about this is that we build upon each other's ideas and what Justin said kind of triggers uh, deeper discussions about the transformation that we can move over to the issue that we'll be creating about that particular problem. So uh, I feel like we can move, move on to other topics because that is definitely an unanswered question, how we're going to, how and where we're going to be doing the transformation. But I feel like uh, overall consensus is that we definitely need to transform the data. We'll definitely get to the bottom of that later. Uh, and please update the notes there if, if they're not complete, Paul uh, and Thomas, I just wrote there. Uh, Justin, uh, your point, and we're ten minutes uh, at the from from the end. Go ahead. Uh, this yeah, it sounds like just more of the same. Like I think we've already uh, beat this state management horse to death. <laughs> we can just move on to the next next point. Okay. Yeah, definitely feels like we already covered it. Uh, it's still your it's still your point. Okay. The next one is uh, more just about. Um, I, I want to make sure we try, and this is a good timing for it. I want to try and wrap this discussion up with more um, actionable baby step items. And it still does seem like attacking the state management is the is the first real step we have is untangling that mess, and that might help inform what we do with the rest of the merge request structure. So, yeah, and I, I'm still, I still really like Thomas's flat structure idea. I think it makes a lot, makes it a lot easier to reason about. Uh, I don't think we need to do a bunch of getters for that to make that work. I, in fact, I think that gets us away from a bunch of getters. If we do, if we transform the data when we get it into a flat structure, it's much easier to pull because then inside of a component, when I want to get a diff ID, it's already keyed by the ID. I'm just grabbing it. it it's very, very simple. Um, yeah. yeah, these are yeah. These are my ideas of how I thought we could move forward. That starting the structure, um, and then attacking the presentation log logic one side at a time in line versus parallel. And bottom up thoughts, comments. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel like these three steps are kind of like the overarching topics. Um, so definitely feels like 
a potential way forward. Um, I think so just so that you understand my ideas is grabbing all the takeaways and shaping them into sub epics or sub issues out of the topic we have right now. And then we can drill down on each one of those so that we can then start scheduling deliverables and have a plan like over going in, into the future. Um, so a lot of this thing still requires further discussion. Um, so what's the actual extractions of the state that you're talking about from the components? How are we going to be starting to do that? I don't think we'll be having like a, a two deliverable thing at the end of this. We'll have several of these. Uh, I would say at least more than a dozen um, for sure. Several dozens actually. Uh, so, so out of this, so I think we're definitely going to be using baby steps. There's no, no, no doubt. Um, whether, but it's important for us to have these discussions, whether we'll be building a new app on the side, whether we'll be iterating on the current one. Uh, I think one thing we need to keep in mind is we want to keep this bringing value to the users at, at each step. Um, if we're building a new app, we need to integrate that new app with the current app, right? So that the users benefit from that, uh, from those improvements as we go. Because I don't want us to have a eight month stretch where only at the end we'll show it to users because we'll definitely start learning a lot as we go um, during those eight months. But I do expect it to be that, that long. So th by the time we're done with this, it will, it will have gone significant amount of time. But um, so that just your, you, you understand my expectation of this topic. Um, it's going to be probably the largest we have this year in source code. So um, yeah, the, the baby steps make sense. We definitely need to drill down much more each one of these into deliverables on the issues themselves. Anyone has any more thoughts on these uh, points that Justin raised? I think his his point his point that references me there the first one was start starting by extracting state and starting a plot structure. Um, I think that's that's a fairly big lift, um, and we need some architectural thought initially. Um, but once we get the state into like that that flat point that flat structure. Um, all of the other like things that touch state kind of are a lot easier because because like Justin was saying a minute ago and like I referenced it in the epic once it's once it's flat you just like you have the idea you just pull it it like it's it's just there you don't have to worry about computing the differences um, and we can start rewriting small components at a time that reference this new state and that can be things that we roll out iteratively. Right. Sorry for the key noise. I didn't realize I was unmuted. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so we'll definitely bear in mind that again, going forward with baby steps, a couple of major topics. Okay. Uh, I definitely need to expand that later. Um, right. Any more ideas here on the baby steps? I think we're all pretty much on board. Good. One, one, oh, sorry. One really small idea is if we can define the problem really well and we can break it up, like you could get community contributors involved in issues. And so there is a, there is a benefit too with defining the problem really well, because then we can, then the momentum is, is scaled. Uh, creating like weight to, issues seem to be picked up um, and attractive to the users, especially high visible things like for MR devs. I think, I think that there's an opportunity there. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, we definitely saw the benefit of breaking epics into smaller issues. I think they're easier. I think they're easier when we have, like you said, a very well-defined problem. Like rework this, follow this approach, and if we have sort of a map and plan, we can definitely try to leverage the community um, for it. Usually, I haven't seen a lot of successful community contributions on refactors per se. Like 
deep complex refactors. Um, but I feel like you have a great point about if we prepare it well and if we document it well with an out expected outcome, kind of like the recent efforts, like the local view we write, we've done, like we have input, which files we're addressing, what's the, the strategy, and then the outcome is this, like a little recipe, we can definitely have the benefit of that. So we'll keep that in mind if you have a big Just task to do. Right. No, sorry. Then I'm only interrupting because I know. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. I'm already Justin done. Great. Justin has a great example Omar, for that. And so I think, I think maybe putting together a guide for here's, here's our end goal and here's how we take baby steps. Um, that would be really cool. And, and Justin has a really good Omar for that. Um, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm muting myself. Yep. That makes sense. <laughs> uh, Thomas, you're writing, do you, want to vocal, do you want to vocalize that or are you just documenting what has been said? Um, I'm answering some kind of deep questions that Justin and I have gotten into. <laughs> um, I don't know that we need to talk about it. Um, okay, so we're, 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 we're two minutes. We okay, good. So it's definitely deeper conversations to bring over to the issues. Um, so we're two minutes away from the end. Uh, I had one crazy idea that I keep bringing back. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of context on this uh, server-side rendering topic is, so we've looked at comp competition and uh, a lot of the difference that we see is that um, from the get-go, right, the perceived performance on their pages sometimes is immediately faster because a lot of it comes, comes rendered from the server. Now, we don't have the same structure, we don't have the same scale, we don't have the same solution, but what I see is that we're bootstrapping the entire UI on the front end alone. And I keep bringing this, like if Tim Zalman has a dream up there, I have another dream, which is to have like the, the app come render from the server and then we just hydrate with the interaction on top of it. Um, there are significant challenges to this that we have identified in the past, but I wanted to, since we're discussing this moment in time, like rebuilding the, or just improving the diff app, does this topic, could this topic help at all? And do you have any ideas on how we could feasibly pursue it? Or is this just not a good idea at this point? And thoughts are welcome. I think SSR would fit really well, but I thought there was a, a technical limitation with Rails that we could just straight couldn't do it, like it was off the table. I don't know the answer to that question. That's what I keep hearing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I keep hearing that uh, it's hard to get Rails to render view apps, get to render a full, full view app. Um, and the topic always brings, hey, if we had a node server, we could probably get this quicker. I think there's something we need to bear in mind. And this is something that has been on my mind every time I since GitLab, ever since I joined GitLab, which is we're not like other companies and other products. We have to bear in mind that we have a product that is going to be installed in self-hosted instances, right? So the management of the application at the self-hosted instance is crucial for our business. So whatever solution we need to, so whatever solution we come up with have to be uh, with that in mind. That's why we are bound a little bit by the number of services we ship uh, and introducing a new dependency on the stack is not something we do lightly. But that being said, if we can justify it with a case and a use case and a, um, um, uh, a reward at the end that justifies the effort, we can probably do some studies, right? If you know what I mean, like get the infrastructure to potentially st study a, a potential scenario, how that would look like. Is it actually, because uh, we've been postponing uh, real-time web sockets because of the scale, but we have a real-time working group and we have a member here on the call, Natalia. So what that means is that, um, it's some problems are just insurmountable until we have space and justification to go find them. So I want you to keep that in mind. I don't think we can put pool server-side rendering within a month for sure. But if, as we go on that journey, on this journey, it's something that we need to bear in mind that if we have a good case, we can get a thread to explore this in, into the future. Uh, which if we have to prepare the code of the, of that we're building right now to later be server-side rendered, something that we can bear in mind. Um, so yeah, we're at, we're over time. I'm sorry. Um, uh, thoughts, we can drop the thoughts in the, in the document. So I'll, as a wrap up, thank you so much for your participation on the call. This has been extremely useful. So I'm going to be putting all of this into issues in epics and then eventually uh, I'm, 
I'm not going to schedule a call for next week right away. It's going to be because the beginning of the milestone and everything, but potentially we'll have some more of these sessions and I'll invite you all again to jump over at this so we can break it down, potentially more topical things like one for stick management, one for transforming, whatever. But I'll keep you posted on what comes down the pipeline in terms of scheduling. Right now, I just have to thank you all for joining the call. And once I have issues and epics built, I will just flood you all uh, over Slack so you can jump on it and have a discussion. Because the discussion is not over. We still have to drill down on these topics. So yeah, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Any parting thoughts, comments? All right. Samantha, get out of that coffee shop. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Stay at home. Stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Live at a coffee shop. All right. Good Bye. to see everyone. Have a great week. See you guys. Bye, everybody. Bye.